Thank you so much for being here tonight. I am Julia Wallace. I'm the chair of the Winthrop Transportation Advisory Committee. Can you all hear me okay? I don't need to go like this. You can hear me like this. <laughs> okay. Um, excellent. Just, just to put it out there from the very beginning, we will have opportunity for questions at the end. Um, we have two mics on either side. Um, it's important to consider that you won't be heard unless you speak into the mic because we are recording on WCAT. Um, so resist the temptation to shout from the bleachers. Um, come on down to the, to the mics. Um, so anyway, it's so great to see you all here on a Thursday evening to learn about one of my very favorite topics, parking. I had no idea so many people cared about it as well. Um, and Jason will get into this a little bit more, uh, Jason Schreiber, our speaker tonight. But ultimately, we're here, we care about, parking is not really about cars. It's really about human beings. It's about people and how we access and experience our town, right? And as most of you know, our town is on the brink of some pretty big changes. We have a new master plan. We have some significant development projects um, on dock and some real significant opportunity to bring new life, new business, and new and desperately needed um, business activity and tax revenue to our town. So having the right policy, parking policies in place now is more crucial than ever, um, especially for a town like us that's looking to add new residents, new visitors, new activities, new reasons to come and enjoy our, our downtown in a variety of ways. Um, I'm thrilled to have Jason Schreiber from Nelson Nygaard here tonight. Um, I, I can uh, attribute much of what I know today about parking and development policy from Jason, um, so thank you for that. Um, and he's here to share some of those effective policies and parking management practices with us. So before I introduce Jason, I just wanted to um, have you hear a few words from our town council president, Russ Sanford. I'd just like to thank Julia uh, for setting this uh, uh, program up tonight. I know Jason's a hard guy to get hold of and, and we're uh, very uh, excited about having him here tonight. There's been a lot of controversy relative to the center and other areas of, of Winthrop that we're moving forward. Uh, tonight's going to be an educational type of a, uh, engagement. I'm looking forward to hear what Jason has to say, and uh, thank you all for coming. Maybe our town manager would like to say a couple of words, Terry? Uh, thank you, and uh, I, you know, I know I'm not the most popular guy in town these days with the pilot in the center, um, but certainly uh, this is an educational forum. I'm excited to learn uh, some more about parking myself. Uh, the pilot was implemented and uh, is designed to generate conversation and exchange of ideas to see what the end result should be. Um, so I would like everyone to keep their minds open uh, to what Jason has to say tonight, and then we can all go back and exchange uh, uh, future ideas on email, and also please keep an eye on surveys. Uh, second survey about the center pilot will be coming out very shortly with a second set of questions, and then we'll do a third and a fourth as we progress along. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks, Terry and Russ. All right. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, just a brief introduction about who, who is this guy we've brought to Winthrop. Um, just to be totally transparent, this is Jason's first time to Winthrop tonight. Um, Jason is not hired by the town, he's actually not contracted at all, he's just doing this purely as a labor of love um, and to, to help our town move forward. Um, Jason Schreiber has over 20 years of experience leading parking and transportation projects across the United States and overseas. For the past 10 years at Nelson Nygaard, he has led the firm's parking and transportation demand management sector, helping to implement innovative solutions in places across the country. Jason previously led planning efforts for Cambridge, Massachusetts municipal parking system, while also managing parking regulations for over 20,000 private off-street spaces and curb regulations citywide. He now manages downtown planning and parking management projects for Nelson Nygaard throughout Metro Boston and many other regions. Many other regions. Recent efforts include developing new shared parking strategies for a coalition of cities across the United States, successfully implementing downtown paid parking in cities for the first time, managing complex demand management programs for major institutional clients, and merging these techniques to have several major mixed-use developments approved by municipalities around North America. But above all that he's done, Jason loves New England, small downtowns, and is thrilled to join us tonight. So without further ado, I'm very proud to introduce Jason Driver. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Julia. You hear me good over there? I'm going to step over here on uh, the stage because there's, I think, a lot of cool things in these slides. I took a, a chance to drive around and look at your community a little bit. I've lived in the Boston area for pretty much all of my life other than some stints in a couple of other cities. So I do particularly love downtowns like yours. And having just driven around, I think it's really, really cute and cool. I got some pictures later in the slideshow about what your downtown is, and a little bit about what you guys are thinking about it may be becoming. Um, and to me, that's inspirational, because I think some of the best places in America are all patterned off of New England downtowns, quite frankly. I mean, I travel all around the country, and I see things that people are trying to do in their downtowns in stucco and steel with facades that look like stuff you guys already have here. And Unfortunately, some of the best lessons on how to manage access and parking actually come from those other downtowns because they've been a little bit more willing to change, a little bit more willing to adapt. Um, one thing, though, I will say that is unique about Winthrop in my relatively brief experience, I think I was here a long time ago in college or something like that, going to a beach or maybe I went out to Deer Island or something, um, that I can't quite fully understand. Um, it, you have this great building that we're in right now tonight, which is awesome. And can you explain to me why, after seeing all these cute little downtown New England streets, you guys are prepared for C-130s to land on the roads around this high school? I'm amazed by the amount of asphalt you have. So if you ever have a parking problem, just you know, add some angled parking all around your high school and you'll all be safe. You'll have plenty of places to park around your community. Now, if that were to happen, the pitchforks might come. I realize as I work in New England downtowns that there's a lot of resistance to the idea of changing anybody's approach to parking. And when you have a lot of pavement and you're gonna squeeze it up with cars, that sounds like a scary idea. Or if you're in a downtown like you have and you don't have a lot of pavement and you're going to try to squeeze in as many more cars as you can, making space and those places is so valuable, but it would be disastrous, disastrous to turn spaces into something more beautiful and productive. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of places. This one is near and dear to my heart. It spends a few years working there. But what's important about this place, Nantucket, is things like that. Are those kinds of spaces? This is how Nantucket manages its parking system. The most valuable stuff in its downtown is not the curb and the parking. It's all the cool stuff. But Nantucket, the place of, by the way, everything is nice gray, Nantucket historically sensitive and beautiful, weathered, historic. No, 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 only you, only you repeatedly to such an extreme extent that those beautiful streets are lined every 20 feet with a sign that says what you can and you cannot do because they're so hyper obsessed with managing their parking and their access when the thing I want to get to is the building behind it and they let it, literally let people park on their beautiful brick sidewalks in Nantucket in total violation of any accessibility laws of the United States. I have no idea how they've gotten away with it because they're so worried about managing it correctly. They're so worried about introducing something a little bit different. And as a result, they're broken. Where I should be able to be enjoying their historic, beautiful waterfront, half the time I can't get around the cars in the summertime. Here's another place, Rockport. Unbelievable environment, another waterfront community. Who wouldn't want to be there? These are all the no, 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 resident only, you can't park here signs that scatter Rockport. This is Winchester, beautiful Boston suburb, great place to go, great restaurants, go there sometime. Scattered with what you can and cannot do. Parking management gone wrong. You pay for parking here, you don't for here, you have a permit there, you don't have a permit there. You can stay for only a certain amount of time, get out if you stay any longer and don't park here if you aren't who you're supposed to be. This is a really beautiful little community I found just a few minutes ago. This is downtown Winthrop. What a wonderful, awesome, 
active pedestrian environment with great buildings, great structures, some parking resources, and places that people who live in right next door to downtown, it's the best thing you could ever want to be able to live nearby and other people want to do it. There's new development, you probably have development pressure to get close to that. I want to move here if I can someday. These are the kinds of downtowns that are wonderful. You're starting to get the no signs. I only found a few today, but they're already out there. Only you, only me. I don't think you're at Nantucket. You're not at Rockport or Winchester, but you're heading down a road that I want to caution you against going, which is the road that says, thou shalt not do this. People don't respond well to no. They respond well to alternatives, to ideas. It certainly, hopefully, will never be as bad as it is in Somerville, where I live. Because that's literally gotten to the point where the church is telling you that God says you cannot park here. It's insane. I love that sign. And of course, on the right is the, the New York version of it. And you know that's what a lot of people say about that when they bring in a parking meter. So I'm going to tell you another story. This is about Medford. So Medford's a great little downtown, obviously busier than Winthrop. Um, it's recently enacted parking pricing for a reason, but hadn't for years. And this is a picture of when it didn't have any parking pricing. And what's interesting about this story is they had a parking problem. And the parking problem centered on that spot right up there. That spot is where they used to have a garage. And when it fell down, all they could think about was replacing it. Well, the truth is it didn't just fall down. It fell down because they couldn't afford to keep it up. It was only 23 years old, I think. And in fact, it fell down because they didn't know how to take care of it because they weren't collecting any money or resources or taxes to take care of it after it got built. And their own street sweeper, which is how you should never take care of a parking garage, drove through the top deck one rusty morning. So they took care of that and they said, all right, we need a parking study to justify getting a new parking garage. And here's the beautiful parking study conclusions at the end. That parking lot was 73 spaces. In fact, it still is 73 spaces. And this is the proposed parking garage to go in there to solve the parking problems of Medford. 238 spaces, but the net difference is only about 150, 160 parking spaces. But that was gonna solve everything for them. So we did a parking study all over that square. And this is, one of the end results of what was the peak parking demand, and basically where it's more darkly shaded, which is that parking lot, there's more demand, and where it's more lightly shaded, there's less demand. Well, one thing that we noticed in this, that there was a clear break in the data. There's a west side of the square that had utilization, and I'm being wonky here, these are bar charts that show you the utilization of cars across the hours of the day from left to right. And in the west side of the square, it was about 75% utilized. That's pretty well utilized. In some places, you couldn't find parking. And on the east side of the square, it was only about 55% utilized. Like night and day, like a totally different square, yet it was just right there. And the right there between west square that was all busy and east square that was nowhere near as busy was this intersection. And this intersection, right in the heart of their downtown, had been turned into a traffic sewer because it came off of I-93. And that was all the town had focused on, was being able to convey the cars. And we said, well, you know, if we looked at this a little bit differently, would things change? Because it turns out when you analyzed it, walking across that intersection, this is what it's sort of like walking across all the crosswalks to get to the other side, it was horrible. You were like waiting for two to three minutes just to cross a crosswalk. And then you had to get to another crosswalk. And this was the moat that divided the heart of their downtown. And what we said was, well, you know, you could make it a normal four-way intersection. You might be able to change the circulation patterns a little bit. And what we determined was, well, if in that location, today you can only walk this far around the square, and out here, there's all this empty parking. And if we 
change the intersection and we walk this far, suddenly people who are willing to walk that far to find parking will be willing to walk this far to find parking. And so the end result of the process was that if Medford turned their downtown square from this into this, they could effectively gain well, only about a 100 space parking garage, not a 160 space parking garage, for a fraction of the cost. But the key here is that they did it using existing resources and they did it to their obviously greater benefit of creating a public square. Now Medford hasn't built it yet, but Medford has not built their parking garage yet either. And in fact, they concluded through this that they need to start managing things a little bit more smartly. That part of the solution for their parking woes was how they treated parking, how they thought about parking in their downtown, how people accessed it, how they walked especially to it. This is Haverhill, another downtown. And if you've been to Haverhill, north of uh, Metro Boston, it is a lot of beautiful old mill buildings on the west side of downtown. Unbelievable kind of historic density. I can't remember what they made there. Collars, shirts, something like that. And this area has had a lot of revitalization. There's been a lot more interest, a lot of people moving in. It's had a lot of activity, new storefronts being uh, renovated and improved. Um, and they you know, they have the train, which is a nice thing, but it only comes through once in a while. But what's fascinating is the other side of downtown Haverhill over here. So this is the sort of like the traditional business district that got built outside of those old historic mills. And it is consistently this, wide open fields of parking. There's a parking deck, there's a lot of private parking that people are not using and even on street parking. And so we did another study and the conclusion was, and this is a heat map sort of, where it's red there's a lot of people parking and where it's white there's not. And that west side in the downtown where everybody wanted to be, everybody parked. And on the east side of the downtown where there was lots of surface parking wide open, nobody was parking. And so this basic equation was a lot like what we saw in Medford earlier. But what's going on here is just simply a lack of a desire to walk because there was zero incentive for somebody to walk just a little further, just across the street, around the corner, to another parking lot to park a little bit long term. At the end of the work we were doing, Haverhill created a huge parking plan and they started pricing, which I'm not gonna say you guys need, but they started a management tool that involved pricing for the first time in 53 years. Lots of communities ripped out their meters in the 50s and 60s thinking it was the way to compete with the suburban mall and then they really died. Anyways, so one thing that was key about it is they have free parking all the way until 3 p.m. They only price at a certain time of day when the demand is highest. They used a management tool that wasn't about you can or cannot park here. This is time limited all the time. It was wide open all day long until a certain time when the problem was, and only on that western part of downtown. They had a very targeted approach, and the key is the business community and their customers lit up. Haverhill today has more cars parking in it than before, more businesses open in it than before, more people can actually find parking than before in that western part of downtown because some people said, I don't want to pay for parking and they went to the east side of downtown. Of course, most people coming into all those businesses don't really care, they finally get parking out front. The key here is that Haverhill and Medford before it learned basic lessons about how people perform. Unfortunately, Haverhill also got in the middle of our parking study one of these, a brand new downtown parking garage which Medford was dying for and the state had already approved it. And this was gonna solve all of their parking problems because now they're gonna get this great new parking garage. And I said, oh my gosh, I just did the numbers. That thing's never gonna be used by anybody. 
And they said, oh, right, well, you'll see when you get to the end of your study. And they opened the garage six months before the end of the study. And the thing was never used by anybody for a year and a half until they said they will adopt the recommendations and start pricing. And finally, that garage, the MVRTA has never sent me a thank you note, started getting used and covering all of its debt service. But this lesson of parking supply is really hard for us to learn. Because as you know, we have entitlement in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, thou shalt have a parking space. We're Americans, after all. We should all have parking. And so the state provides these. This is Salem's newish downtown parking garage, which is never more than about three quarters full max. This is Beverly's, which is never more than about half full max. And it's because the solution for providing supply doesn't work unless you're also managing your parking and really doesn't work unless you think about it creatively as part of an entire system. This is a lot of wasted money when you build a parking garage because every empty parking space is a crazily overspent asset. So $20,000 per parking space is cheap these days. You know, you can build something on the ground, it'll cost you 5,000 a parking space new. You build something above ground, it's at least 25,000, and in Boston and other areas, we're going below 50,000. So at these kinds of costs, you're talking about a transaction none of us ever want to even think about. So if I assumed it was $20,000 a parking space, and I gave you a 3% interest rate, which is the lowest interest rate you can get on borrowing money these days. It's really low for something like a garage. And I extended it to 30 years, which is way past the lifespan. Any bond anybody will give anybody to finance a parking garage. And I just do a little reverse calculation, mortgage amortization. We all do it if we ever want to buy a home. That equals $125 per space per month. Got to maintain it. National averages are about $300 per year. So let's say $150 per space per month. Now, even if you collected $50 a month, it's still $100 of subsidy that you're providing by creating a parking garage in your community. And the T is lucky you collect $50 a month in Beverly. So that's a subsidy of $5 a day to drive. And the basic math of this equation is very simple. It's cheaper to pay people not to drive and put them on free buses than it is to build a parking garage. Until you get to a point where the market warrants $150 a month or more. Yeah, you can do that in downtown Boston. Do you guys pay $150 a month to park in Winthrop? Yeah, I don't think so. The other trade-off that these communities are starting to realize is that you provide parking and parking spaces. You're making a important decision that says, I want to create a bedroom for a car, not a person, in lieu of a highly productive restaurant table or office space or the bedroom that would take up the space of that parked car. There's some serious trade-offs about parking. We can't go into the decision of using parking very lightly. And it's these realizations that cities all around America and small towns are using to say, huh, well, maybe that parking space out front is valuable for something else. This is a parklet. This is a big one in New York City. It was only like three parked cars. And now it's thousands of dollars of revenue, not only for the city to collect, but for the business to create and then to get tax revenues. Oops, hang on. And this is one in Lexington. And these are our policies that Cambridge and Boston and Somerville are all enacting. You're starting to see these ideas of parklets around the region. So why are places trading parking for more valuable stuff? Sure, it's an economics thing. But here I'm going to get really nerdy. I love animation. Okay, So the idea of what we have in Winthrop, in Medford, in Haverhill, in Somerville, in Rockport, you pick the small town, is not suburban. So in a suburban place, you got a big road, 
Route 9, Route 1, I don't know, wherever you want. And places are scattered around it. Places where you may go to school, shop, work, play, whatever it is. Let's say I live in this suburban place. I don't know, it's Framingham, uh, I don't know, Pickett, Natick. Every single place has a parking lot, and that's how I expect to arrive. I only drive. So I'm driving in, and I'm going to drop my daughter off at school in the morning, and then I'm going to head over to work, and at the end of the day, I'm going to pick her up at school, drop her off at soccer practice, head over to the grocery store to pick up some food for dinner, go back after soccer, and head home. Normal day. Every single one of those T's is a turning movement that I just created. To be able to park in a suburban downtown, those turning movements represent lots of traffic. That's the delay, that's why Route 9 stinks. So in a mixed use downtown, much like yours, where there's hopefully more streets because there's a grid and it's a little bit more connected, and those uses are a little bit tighter and clustered, as yours are, it's very possible that the parking is also tight and clustered, and I can just drive in, and my daughter can walk to school while I walk to work, and she'll go to soccer on her own, and I'll hit the grocery store on the way home and meet her back at the car and drive home, and by doing that and creating only two turning movements, not only have I have the parking area, have the land area required, but I've slashed the amount of trips and incredibly reduce the amount of congestion in a downtown. The idea of a downtown like yours is that it's hyper-efficient at sharing parking resources. This is an example, one way of sharing things, which is I parked once and I did something else in somebody else's business, place, whatever, on my feet. That other business didn't require a parking space for me like it did in Framingham and Natick. I just walked. Your downtown needs less than half the amount of parking that anybody else in all of the suburban downtowns of America would ever need for the same amount of businesses and residences. There's another thing about sharing, and then I'll stop doing these wonky graphics. This is the demand across the hours of the day for, what's this case, this is a restaurant. And it peaks and it goes up, let's say it's a lunchtime restaurant. Its highest demand is at noon and it comes up again in the evening. So its highest demand is at noon and the rest of the day it's, you know, building to it, whatever. Well, when we build parking, we build it for the restaurant plus a little bit of extra margin just to be safe. So then, let's say there's an office next door and its demand is around midday, we build more parking. Or downtown residential. Its demand peak is actually overnight at 2 a.m., but we want to build enough parking to cover it. When we treat each and every business as though, or a residence, as though it has to solve its parking problem on its own land, you get a lot of horrible parking. But when we share it, we have, in just that example, a third slashed automatically. And then I can layer on the fact that somebody might actually walk across the street to go to a business instead of drive right across the street, and that can come down another 50%. So these natural dynamics are what places around America have started to learn. And so now I'm gonna try to take you through an experience that takes all this crazy learning and tries to tell you that parking can be happy. Because as Julia said earlier, parking isn't about, isn't about parking and parking access. It is about economic development. It is about actually not parking at all. Nobody wants to think about parking. They want the experience to be an excellent experience. So you have a parking problem. I say you probably have a front door problem. Downtowns always worry about parking problems. And I drove through your downtown, and it's hard to find parking right on the main drag. Everybody wants to be there. I think this is, I don't know, Concord, New Hampshire or something like that. It happens anywhere you go. Everybody wants to be out front. And then, as I drove into your downtown, the street I came in on was full of parking and there was a little P on a parking lot that had tons of spaces on it and it was just across the way around the corner, just like here in Concord, behind the buildings, where you'll find all sorts of parking all the time. The basic dynamics of where to go, I mean, if I was using in Salem where they used to price things, 
that's a tool I could use. But traditionally in downtowns, they were pricing their garage higher because they had to cover the garage debt. And their streets were cheap. And we said, that's crazy because why would anybody use the garage? That's why it's empty. And so today they flipped it all. And the streets are expensive. And the garages are even cheaper. And now their garages get used. And guess what's happened in Salem? Their harbor garage got used for the first time in 20 years. And people can find parking in downtown Salem. Now, pricing isn't the only management tool, but what they recognized was the value of the front door. Now, OK, I'm not going to price. I'm going to say, well, why can't I get somebody out to that parking space across the way? Why can't I get somebody to realize there's parking on that street along the tennis courts as I approached your downtown that anybody could go to that is a two and a half minute walk away? Well, sometimes it's just signing. Long-term parking that way, short-term parking that way. You guys have a lot of parking signs, but you don't have things that tell me this is only for short-term one-hour parking. Out there, you can park all day long. We don't care. It's a great resource. Go find it. Signing, like having a simple sign on any place that looks cool is really, really valuable. You have a few P signs in your downtown. Live it up. Be fun. Let people know that if they walk down that alley, they're going to find a parking space. There is no limit to the amount of creativity you can do with basic information around signs, basic tools and guidance that also recognize that, you know, I'm scared. I want to get back to my car. How did I go? Let people know that. Let people know the best way to go. And some of this stuff you can just make it yourselves and strap it on with a zip tie. You don't need to have a wild, crazy, highly expensive signing program. In Lexington, they just made a bunch of cards and handed them out at the businesses and the restaurants. And people said, oh, I didn't know there was parking over here in the evenings. I always thought I had to park here when I could never find parking. I can go there. That's a nice walk. There's a cool place for dessert on the way. Thank you, Lexington. This is Hudson's. It's cute. Got a little bit of an artistic effect. I don't know how they did that. And a lot of places are saying, well, wait a minute, information, I don't want to have to hunt down a card. I want to be told. Business districts, local nice people, police are all taking the amb ambassadorial approach to be ambassadors of downtowns. In fact, the people who write tickets in all of these cities are now their downtown ambassadors. And the first thing they do is not write the ticket. The first thing they do is say, hey, did you know there's parking around the corner? So I also say another parking problem you might have is a complete lack of efficiency. I've seen lots of parking lots in downtown Winthrop. And I'm like, huh, what's going on? And this is the same problem that we saw in Lexington. We did some work. This is their library, this is their library lot, this is somebody else's 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 lot. You combine them all, you, you can actually increase supply because I got rid of all sorts of redundancies and fences and all this kind of stuff. This is basic sharing and Lexington said, oh, that's scary. The, they won't let us do that. We'll, we'll lose our zoning rights, really? No, okay. Well, but, the, but insurance. They, they won't let us do that. No, we're all insured 100% the same way. The banks will ever, never let me reinvest in it. Red herring. The bank would be thrilled if you had more parking available. The bank would be thrilled if you had a nice parking lot instead of a bunch of chopped up fence lines. Oh, where can we find an example? Lexington has had a shared parking agreement for about 20 years with its church and lets all sorts of businesses park out back. Sometimes the answers to the problems are right there. And I wouldn't be surprised if you all know of a nice little shared parking agreement, formal or informal, that might exist in Winthrop that could provide an opportunity where you think there might be a lot of stress in your downtown. It's the kind of thing that people have been doing all over the place. I just found this one a few years ago. This is in West Concord, where they just did it on their own. It's a national best practice now, where this, these are all separate parcels in the West Concord Village um, area, and they treat it as one big parking lot. They all made 
actually written but relatively informal agreements to create a nice parking lot that you just walk to down that little alley and you get into this nice parking lot. And so suddenly they created the resource themselves without the town even getting involved. Finally, you manage your downtown with time limits. I caution the use of time limits. And there's a reason. A time limit basically says, get out. But what else does a time limit say? I mean, a time limit is there to say, you've come into our downtown, thank you. You're going to shop at our businesses. You're going to dine at our restaurants. Ooh, but if you stay more than 60 minutes, you're going to get a ticket. Now, you may all know that, I don't know, I would never get a ticket. I always hear this. I go out. And, oh, no, we know you're not going to get I don't know I'm not going to get a ticket. So I wanted to go to that cool place in Winthrop today, and I could not because there's no way I was going to get out in an hour. So one thing we try to get people to focus on is that the solutions are not necessarily about turnover. I do not care at all if somebody moves their car. I can have a parking lot of 10 spaces and five cars can sit in it all day long. If there's still five empty spaces, it's 50% available to me and I can park there. The only thing that matters to me is, is there available parking? And what are the tools to make available parking? I can institute a time limit, that's fine. But all a time limit's gonna do is push people around. Availability is the most important thing. And when we look at downtowns, we try to think about everything that might be available. We try to think about shared arrangements. We try to bring in solutions that actually try to work with what you've got because in the end, one of the key things about a downtown and parking has got nothing to do with the car. It has everything to do with the walk. It has everything to do with the experience of the downtown that I just saw that I wanted to walk around. And every single person who parks in all of America is also a pedestrian, period. And when you're storming into your downtown, into your parking space, and you don't want to yield for the person who's walking across the street, they were probably the motorist who didn't decide to drive to where you're trying to go to. So yield to them next time. Recognize that downtowns like Portsmouth who've really said we're going to do this smart, managing through a creative suite of time limits and pricing and all sorts of stuff, whatever it is, are trying to make the spaces out front work are trying to make creative things. Cambridge is focused on walking signs that get people to know what it's like to walk and how close they are to the next thing. Lexington is finally recognizing that they need a sign to let people know that that's where their parking is, because I wouldn't have ever known it walking down the street. And everywhere and wherever, and I could so substitute this with a picture from your downtown where I just was two minutes ago. Everywhere and everywhere you want somebody to go to another parking facility, don't make it be the super long, scary crosswalk. I mean, I, I was like, I would go there, but I don't want to. Why would anybody want to go park across, over by the fields, by your tennis courts, by your old school building across from downtown? Because it's a long distance. These solutions that I showed you earlier, Medford's, are solutions that are all being financed by not having built more parking. And instead, whether they're managing it through pricing or they're managing it on the savings of the monies that they were putting away for a parking garage that they don't need to build, this one's actually just been implemented in Belmont finally, are all because they realized that the solution for a better parking experience had to do with what it was like when you're on your foots. So, four basic things, if you're going to have any little takeaways here. Signing in information. Do it. 
Like, it's so easy. You've got a lot of signs. There's nothing about the signs in your downtown that make it clear to me where I, as a customer, should be comfortable and willing to park. That there is something else if I can't find parking out front just across the way. In fact, you have a lot of signs creeping in that say no. And that's a problem. Access. It's all about the walk. Make the walk work better. Make it a great way to get around in Winthrop. It's already a really good way. It's a kind of cool way. I like those blue crosswalks. They're very bright. Efficiency. If you want to make things work efficiently, you need to save money. And the best way to save money is to think about working in a shared system. You've got parking and resources. There's this like strip mall thing that's downtown. And there was something around the corner from that. I'm like, oh yeah, it looked like it was an old drive through and it's like, you know, there's like 40, the downtown streets are busy right now. There's like 40 parking spaces in that thing. So let's talk, let's lease parking from that guy. Let's not spend tons of money on building parking resources. And then rewarding good behavior. Make it so that if anybody wants to actually do the right thing, which is walk from a parking space further away, or bless their hearts, just decide to walk all the way into town, or bike into town, or take a bus, or whatever else, reward that thing. Make it so that there is, it's free, you can park forever, as long as you want, out here, and in town. Yeah, well, we're gonna have some time limits. Maybe someday you will put in meters, who knows. But make it so that somebody who does the right thing has a nice walk, has a well-lit path, doesn't feel threatened when they're walking from the remote space, has the flexibility to get back to their car whenever they want. I think that parking management is not actually a hard thing. It's really only about recognizing that we all are human, we have certain wants and needs, and the biggest problem with understanding how we should behave and how to manage a downtown is that we have expectations. We want to park out front. Everybody wants to park out front. And there's just no way to put that many cars out front into a restaurant with 40 people. But really, the key is that we're not here to talk about parking. We really are here to talk about how we get to our end destination. We're really here to talk about what are the things that we like to get to and why can't we get to them faster. And whatever management tool you wind up with someday, Every single downtown I've worked in that has said, oh my God, it's the 10th parking study. We need to figure out how to manage this. All nine of them said we should price or we should drop the price or we should build a garage. And in every single one of them, the first people who supported being smarter, who said, charge out front or introduce pricing for the first time in 53 years were the merchants or the businesses. Because the key thing that will keep your economy going, that will keep your downtown accessible, that will make your downtown cool is availability. Parking availability is it. That's all it is. You may not be ready to price your downtown. I was there tonight you easily could, because you have a lot of cars parking in that downtown. That's fine. If you don't want to do that, recognize that when you do, the people who will line up first, in the end, when they see the numbers about customers, when they see the numbers about access, and fortunately there's state law that says you can turn the money back into your downtown now, they will say, that's the right thing. And that's what you're seeing all throughout the Metro Boston region for a reason. But again, if you don't do it, learn all the other things I just talked about. It's about the walk. It's about the experience. It's about the access. It's about simplicity. And in the end, 
we're all just humans and we want to find the best deal that we possibly can. And hopefully for enough people, that's to walk from a little bit further away. All right. I am done with my soliloquy. I'd love to take your questions, your thoughts, your ideas. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know if there's questions that we should use on the mic if folks have any questions. I'd love to have a conversation with you a little bit about your specifics in town. Julia, you can even introduce it if you like. I think for the sake of uh, the home audiences whenever we'd want to use the microphone. But if there's any questions, uh, I'd love to chat with you. Sure. So I can, work. Can you, can you introduce yeah. yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Karen Brown. I work in Winthrop Center. I've been there for 15 years. I drive here every day from Danvers. So um, the issue we have right now is our clients don't have anywhere to park, even though your plan looks great for future. What do you suggest we do now? I don't even have a place to park. so. I'm, and, and, and I don't know, the town hasn't really notified us of where the public parking is. So here. All right, help me out, I have and a map. I bought a ticket the other day on my car because it was in the municipal lot and it was over two hours. All right, so I have a map. Where is, okay. where is your business, I'm do you know where you are? I'm right on Hagman Road where they blocked off the. So you're in this area right here. Right, they blocked off the. That new closure we talked about. Right, right, right. What's the problem there is everyone goes there to smoke now. So that's the new smoking area. Ah, cool. <laughs> I did drive by that. It was cool. You got picnic tables down there. Of course, there was nobody there enjoying it. Right. So you either have too many picnic tables or it's getting too late in the year, one or the other. Um, well, they just did it. So, have, so where do you park when you can? So before this, I parked in the municipal lot next to Citizens Bank. That's that okay. is like on Hagman Road too. It's oh, like, yes. yes, that's the municipal lot. Or I parked on the street on Hagman Road. So, mm -hmm. right, yeah, so now I can't park in the municipal lot because they have a two hour time limit. And I don't have any parking on the street and <laughs> or around, but also my clients are crying and some of them are older right. and they, have to walk far distances now they can't everyone's been showing up late even myself included because I haven't accounted for that time yet so so, uh, so all right so this lot then mm -hmm. that is still open is being parked by whom? they've taken off a, a good portion of that municipal parking also that they've blocked off for the what that open space. So I, I was by there today and I saw right. that it was there. There's was only a few spaces left right. in it. So did, does, does anybody know who parks in that lot now at the now closures? It, it, well, people that go to the bank or do business. Customers. Customers, customers. Customers in the area. So mostly, and maybe people who work in, you know, in the area and in the bank. So have you tried to park uh, here or there or there well, or there? Well, I'm under the impression that that's Michael's Mall and that we, that's that's the mall. So this is private property, yes, I guess. And, sure. And, yes, and so is the uh, the. And next, that is too. And that's adjacent. So okay. it's that's all private. That's do, all private. do you know what that is? That's part of school property. No, no, that's that public. that's a public lot. Not that's a public lot. That. There was no signage. I don't yet. know so that. I didn't because yeah. there is no signage. It's so dumb. there's two signs we put up. One on uh, Pauline Street and the other one on Walden Street. Okay. So there's two new blue, beautiful signs okay. directing you to that lot. Okay. So, and then what's this big lot? So that's the skating rink. And so I'm not aware that we can park there either. So um, that is a great amount of parking space, but I'm not sure if I could park there or if I should tell my clients to park there. I mean, it's doable. I mean, and then you worry about the winter with clients walking. Some of them are older and so, and that's, you know, they don't, it's, yeah. It's not a great experience. Right. Well, this is that road I was talking about earlier. Like this is, you know, this is, these are great little downtown streets. This is why I love New England. And then I come up to here and I don't even want to think about crossing that road. Right, right. It's not. And, you know, the, the plan, what they have planned sounds great in reality. But right now, if you don't have 
Like all that, like you said, if you have a downtown that's like that, you have to have accessible parking for people because not everybody is, can walk. Like I can't walk here from Danvers. So <laughs> um, I just think that that should have been considered too before they blocked off the street. You know what I mean? Like just where, where are people gonna park right now and without being ticketed or towed or? So, so here's a question. So thank you. So if in this downtown, you know, I was there tonight, fine. Uh, this shows a few, there were a few parking spaces in here when I was there tonight. Um, but yeah, this all, whatever parking is in here, I don't know, 40 spaces is gone or something. So I don't know, there's another 40 or 40 here, but then there's these big parking lots and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, I look at this as an easy resource allocation problem. So there's a lot of parking opportunities around here just on this map, right? And I say to myself, okay, how are they being used? We I mean, can probably just go out and count. I, I mean, I count cars all the time and they make me run around the country like I'm some sort of expert. It's very easy to do. Anybody can go do it. <laughs> write it down on a piece of paper and you know, go back again and write it down again and find out. You know, you get an accumulation, you know. Has it, have you guys done that yet? You haven't done that yet. We're in the process of uh, doing some of that. Okay. We have data boxes out there, counting cars, the volume, queues, uh, some cameras up to show the queues in certain st strategic areas in the center um, of town. So uh, what you're seeing there, Jason, especially where Michael's Mall, which is that white building off to your right a little bit by Jefferson Street, um, I have an email that comes in almost daily from that owner saying that we're inundating his parking and his private mall lot. Um, and certainly, you know, that's been the case in the history of that lot for uh, you know, a good 10 or 15 years, people who go in the center will sneak in there, but uh, he believes our pilot is uh, inundating that, that lot, so it's not usable for, to his customers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, I, I, the, the reason I say to do the counts, and I'm like, you know, I, I, I'll go do them, walk around the lots, count them all up, whatever it is. Tracking it over time is good, but you know, do it all in one sweep of a day. And so you'll know in aggregate, because the reason to treat it in aggregate is that's how your downtown works. There is nobody who goes here and only goes into one business except, you know, half the time. They also maybe go into another business or once they're parked there, they may, whoops, go up here and get a coffee or whatever it is here. If you don't do that, you're not experiencing your downtown and you should. So you park here and you go to the bank, but you may also do something across the street some of those people would say is illegal. You can't park here and then go do something else. But that's exactly what we should do in a downtown. So it's all part of a system. So with that proposition, this parking lot, which frankly, if it was connected with this thing and whatever, you've got a sea of asphalt with tons of parking right there that uh, you know maybe this one is full when this one isn't, but when I was out there, there's tons of parking, fine. You know, There's a higher point of day, so we'll count it when there's more demand is a great opportunity to just introduce a basic agreement. And the agreement says, you're never gonna lose your zoning allocation for parking, you're indemnified like any Massachusetts municipality can be, and let's try the sharing thing out. Maybe, maybe they can actually make some money off of their parking through a leasehold, that maybe it's municipal. That's one way of dealing with it. I do have a question for you. During the master plan for the Senate Business District, um, was developed. They counted private spots and public spots for a total amount of spots of usable parking in the center business district. What is the proper way? We have no control as a municipality over those private lots. My thought process was you only should count what's publicly available and the, what we have control over. How would you have done the study on parking? The entire downtowns of dozens of major cities, big and small, small towns throughout America, their parking supply is 100% privately held. And it's 100% part of the public parking system. There is absolutely nothing that prevents a public entity from going into an arrangement with a private entity, like I showed you in Lexington, like all of Oak Park and Sacramento and all these different communities throughout America do regularly as part of managing a public parking supply. Indianapolis's downtown parking supply is almost 100% private, but you would never, ever, ever know that going into those downtowns. 
it's really just an agreement. And yes, the nice thing that a municipality can do is one thing that they cannot do. So one thing that any of these places have as a hard time is maintaining what they've got. It's an expense. Towns, municipalities have public works departments. They have sign shops. They know how to paint things. When he wants to restripe his lot or maybe do some landscaping or if he, for heaven forbid, has to repave it, that's a huge expense for this landowner. For a town, it's just another increment on their overall cycle of paving, striping, maintaining. Just offering that, as well as some nice signs and a guarantee, a guarantee that, you know, over here it'll always be employee spaces and we'll sign it for employee spaces, but the rest of this stuff is shared for the customer because that's the primary person we're trying to accommodate. Those types of agreements are what underpin system. Fort Lauderdale's downtown parking system is this unbelievable way of offering to every different private landowner a suite of those kinds of options. And they buy into it because it's a deal. Go ahead. Oh, I want to give you a mic. Um, I just want to touch back on the car counters and the boxes and all those things. I don't recall, I could be wrong, but I don't recall ever seeing those before the pilot program began. So what are we comparing the pilot program to? We do have uh, samples before the pilot program but began. But didn't they say at the last meeting that they, that was like three or four years old? No. It was a, it was a week before the actual the uh, pilot took effect. We have data count. We haven't extracted it from the box, so it's still in the box. So we put the counters down about five days prior to September 1st. These are borrowed counters from DOT, but we can also use the same counters after with permission from DOT to extend afterwards. So we, do, we can get another data set November after November 1st on the same streets. So we do have a, a set before, and we can and do have the ability to grab a set after as long as we can use the boxes from DOT. We don't have these traffic counters locally. Um, we don't have a traffic division in Winthrop, so we have to borrow and, and uh, use other agencies when we, when we it can. It would be good if we could continue it on because we don't know what it's going, we all know what Winthrop looks like in the winter with a bad storm, and I think that should be counted in also. The only thing we cannot leave counters down during winter storms, they're torn up by DPW's blades uh, so the, these, are, these are pipes in the middle of the street that are temporary fittings. Uh, we can't leave them in the winter. Okay. Well, we, but we, we don't, we got to remember, too, is in the winter is, is a different animal than in the spring. And uh, the data that comes out of there is, is going to generate volumes that are on streets and not so much volumes in the center in the, in the winter storm, I know, is dead. Is that taken into account, though? Because where the people park, they would park on Hagman Road in that lot during the snowstorms, is that all being well, taken into account? That's a parking account? management problem, and not a volume problem. So there's different parts of the study, and the pilot, when I do my report, will address parking volume, queue time, parking management, or a parking problem. So in the winter when it snows, we might have a parking problem, which needs enforcement to relieve those spots, and not a volume problem on a certain street. But is that all being taken into account in this whole yes, pilot every, process? Yes, every, this report will have different sub-paragraphs okay. to include parking enforcement or a parking problem. Um, we do give out warnings or have been giving out warnings on the two-hour limit to actually track how long people are staying. And their warnings, they're not tickets. Some people have unregistered vehicles, they got tickets. So I just want to clarify that because I get a lot of emails on. Are you giving out tickets? No, we're giving out warnings. And that's the track who's staying there and how long they're staying there. We also tracked vehicles on in that lot that stayed there before the pilot took, took effect and how long they stayed there. So the pilot is, uh, the report of the pilot will be thorough and certainly available to the public with the attached data. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, what you're doing on Hagman Road is the right kind of thing to do in a downtown. I mean, I don't know the full extent of it and you know how many people will end up using that space. But to think about your streets, which 
in this distance here are a lot of streets, right? As places is exactly the kind of thing that has made, you know, I mentioned Rockport earlier, Sing. You know, Salem has done that and is continuing to do that. These are, you know, great opportunities. I'm not saying, as it looks right now, just a few picnic tables, it's going to be what those places look like. But it's worth looking at. And I think, you know, the counts and, and traffic of volumes that you're all doing, it's not that different, the, if, what's happened here, than what might happen if a water main broke or you needed to fix potholes for an extended period. I work in all sorts of places around New England where they've had road closures that go way beyond you know, the project duration of three years to four and five years in places that have far less parking and way more traffic than is going on here. And nobody counts it before and after. They're just needing to do it because they have to fix something. All those places work out very well, and sometimes it's creative parking management solutions, and there's a creative traffic management solution, it's good that you're studying what to do, but sometimes it's, it's an inevitability. And then sometimes when we plan something like that, we, you know, we're all upset about the idea, yet this could be a great thing. Now, it may not be used a lot, but I would conjecture that if you've got all these cool little cute businesses down here, the first thing I would do if you're going to do this is tell them that they can go put restaurant chairs out there. Go put a food truck out there. Go make it an active place. Go bring, if you've created this space, use it. You know, not just once a week. Use it every day. Why not? You know, merchants I, wherever I work, are always like, oh, I'm afraid about this, I'm afraid about that. The ones who are most afraid are the ones who get bypassed. The ones who recognize that, yeah, more restaurant creates more business, creates more activity. That's what happens in the downtown. Uh, three, four, five food trucks on here would be the best thing for all the existing long-term res uh, restaurants in the downtown, for instance. These are the types of things that, you know, maybe you even make this closure periodic or you have parking on the ends and not in the middle or something like that. Uh, be creative with it, but recognize that it's a potentially a really good opportunity given that those streets are all really close together. I think it's kind of cool what you're talking about. Councillor Boyajian. Yeah, um, no, I, I wish we had talked to you a couple of years ago. This is a, a great advice. Um, I'd love to learn... a a little bit more about how you entered into these private partnerships, how, how people did that, because I think that might be the key to our success, because there are lots all around town that are being underutilized at a lot of times. I mean, I think even um, the rink lot during the day, having it timed so that you could utilize it, I think those are all wonderful. But one concern we do have um, is that our population, we have a larger percentage of older um, residents, so how do we help accommodate for them as well? Because I agree, I think the problem is, is, the, is the, the lack of communication about where people can go and things like that, and I think that's a huge idea of signage plus the, the government communicating it, but how do you enter these private public partnerships for these type of things, and what does the lease look like? Because, thank you. So uh, the, the sharing thing I'll get into in a second, I think that's actually very easy. There's tons of precedent, and I'll run through a list of things, but the aging population, the seniors in your community, I want to get to that. Absolutely important, right? Anywhere we go. There are tons of basic precedents that set aside resources specifically for those communities. And we're not talking about all of downtown. We're talking about a few spaces here and a few spaces there with a permit or a plate or something like that. Very, very simple approaches or a lot or what have you. Oftentimes, you will find, as was true with all sorts of folks in my family, actually, the desire and the ability to walk a little bit just from a lot across the street instead of a lot on this side of the street has everything to do with just what they're used to and the fear of crossing a street. Well, you just eliminated a street to be fearful of crossing, so maybe there's an opportunity to now rethink how things are done. Maybe this lot is for specific uses. It's for longer term people with a permit, that's fine. And everything else 
is opened up a little bit more. And then there you start to look at the other parking lots and shared parking agreements to your first question. I, I can just send you like 10 when I get back to the office. They're very, very simple agreements that just talk about access in very simple legal terms. Like I say, Lexington had one with a church. And those exist all over America. What I like is the ones that are actually very informal. And the mechanism to do it is not so much the legal mechanism. The mechanism to make it succeed is those counts. And knowing what's going on and being completely transparent about how many cars there are and how many spaces there are at different times a day and making a value proposition to a landowner. And the value proposition is always that they're going to retain what they have and get something else. When I showed you that uh, map of Lexington, mm -hmm. the get something else was more parking automatically because even in this scenario, if this was all pavement, this would be entirely reconfigured differently and we'd, we'd add 20 parking spaces right there, I guarantee it. There's probably a few others around here where you'd you know, combine and add parking. Easy to do. The other value proposition, as I said earlier, is being able to provide services that those landowners cannot do. So whether it's you're maintaining their lighting as part of the municipal lighting system, or you're providing the signs, or you're doing striping now and then when they need it, those are the burdens that an individual landowner cannot do that a large entity like a municipality can always do. Yeah, and your budgets are constrained. I understand all of that, but there's still a greater ability for a municipality to do some of those low-hanging fruit in-kind services. And of course, the third value proposition is a leasehold. And I think, actually, out of the goodness of their heart, Lexington pays the church in, um, in Lexington Center like $10,000 a year or something like that for 50 business spaces to park out back. So there's a lot of those simple arrangements that can be done. I'm coming to you. I like walking. I have to stretch my legs. Hi. I just wanted to ask a question about businesses that have tractor trailers or large trucks delivering. Has anyone been down the center with the closure of Hagman? Jefferson Street has three new parking spots near the hair salon, the nail salon. So what does a tractor trailer do? I mean, he can't take that corner. I tried to take the corner this evening on Putnam and Jefferson. If there's an SUV parked on the corner, you are blind. You cannot see. Has anyone taken into consideration multiple deliveries for businesses that have huge trucks that have to park almost in the middle of the street now? That's exactly why we're doing the pilot, because we have identified that, the deputy chief has identified those spots need to be moved back on Jefferson and not at the corner. And we have to take care of the corner on Putnam on either side of Jefferson. So we've identified that during the pilot. We also identified the need for a delivery zone. But before we go throw a delivery zone in there, let's get the chamber involved with the people who get big deliveries down there, find out what time of day they need the delivery spot, and then time it. So all the deliveries come between Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 to 3. And we only use that zone between 10 and 3 for deliveries. And we push them off right in front of French Square, where we blocked off that Jefferson Street extension, I call it. It's called Jefferson Street, but we always say Jefferson Street extension right by Samuels. Because that's now blocked off. We could get a delivery zone in there without impacting any further parking issues, but also open that zone up at night or early in the morning when deliveries are not there. So the pilot has already taught us that we need to have communication with the business owners down there that get deliveries. Sweats, got, they have delivery zones on either side of their building, but Pepsi Cola comes in, can he deliver to the three stores instead of moving the truck? Mm. So that's the stuff we're examining. Okay, and then I have one other question. There are plans where the evangelical church building is for condos or apartments? Yeah, I'm not sure the status of those plans. There were plans presented. I don't think they've been approved by the planning board, but yes. Okay. There was plans presented, but not sure approved. 
Okay, and then the old CVS property? There's been no plan submitted to the town or the planning board on that property. A demolition permit has been requested and approved. Okay, so when they start the demolition, that takes away parking spaces, correct? No. No? No. We have the temp construction. The demolitions, you're looking at probably a two to three week process. So it'll be some temporary, but our plan is to bring them in and off of their own property. So you might, you might see it, but it will certainly, it was already supposed to be done. So they're obviously delayed. Um, financing in, on some of these projects do become an issue. So what they present and ask for a demolition permit for a September 1, it certainly didn't happen on September 1, so. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, I just wanted to say the, the loading question, absolutely the right answer, because it is about a time of day thing. And it also extends to all of your curb management is that, you know, you don't do the time limits starting at 8 a.m. You do them later in the day, or you have varying policies about when seniors have, you know, the priority to park somewhere or not. Because it isn't, and that's where the data comes in, it isn't an absolute about anything, and that's the part, point of sharing. During a certain time of day, something is very busy and you don't want a truck parking, and another time of day it doesn't. But here's another thing. Can somebody answer me? Because you're talking about development things, and that's great. There's plenty of communities right now who are getting development questions, so that's good. So people want to come in and do development. You shouldn't shy away from it. What, what's going on with Pauline Street? Why, why doesn't it look to me like there's any parking at all on Pauline itself? That seems like a lot of pavement, no? Or is it too many curb cuts? It's cut up, Jason, with um, extended driveways on the two front entrances on the Pauline. So those uh, mechanics bays there extend pretty far across. Um, and on the other side of the street, again, because of the crosswalks and the line of sight, they're not a really good parking across from Nick's. And then in front of Nick's, I think you have a couple spots there. Down by the in front of the rink before that uh, second crosswalk on Pauline, there is parking allowed there. Um, and certainly, um, you know, inside the rink to your left used to be the school. It's no longer the school. I think in my email I said we're going to be looking to uh, ask for long-term parking in the Walden Street lot as well as to the lot to the left uh, for long-term parking. But again, that will be coming out with the whole parking examination process that's going on under another committee. This gentleman does have a question, though. And he's been very patient. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for coming. This was a really extraordinary. Um, second, just a bit of a confession. In addition to being a winter president, I'm on the MBTA board. We hire you guys to redesign our bus system. We obviously need you on the parking side as well. So. Uh, we'll figure that out. We're working with Evan right now. Um, just a piece of, of, of advice, if you will. When you're dealing with such a compact area, we've got a whole series of things going on. It's thinking about parking and circulation. It's thinking about pedestrian movements, about economic development, and about usable open space and connectivity. Um, to the extent that the town's ready to move forward on all this, what are the skill sets that the town needs to retain um, in a consulting team that helps bring all that together. I'm sure it's just beyond thinking about traffic and parking, but could you comment on the composition of teams that you have seen in other localities? I mean, it, it's always varied, I think, without doubt, that you want to try to think about things holistically as you go into this. So, um, you know, you may have a master plan, you may have some conceptual ideas, and you need to kind of drill down to the next level. I would always caution against looking at things in silos. You don't want to, because it's all you can afford, just do traffic and, and then some other time just do real estate and then some other time just do design and some other time just do parking. You really should try to look at it all comprehensively and sometimes that does require saving up resources to be able to do it smartly. I would say without doubt, though, that some of the smarter approaches to looking at these things are in strong partnership with your community. So we, I'm a consulting firm, I go around the country, and some of the greatest things that can happen are when a community 
decides to go out and collect its own data, when a community decides to go out and get people involved, and those high paid consultants are just putting it on maps and making it look good and then helping through interpretations with the community on what all that information means. And it sounds kind of fluffy what I'm talking about, but that is exactly how successful consulting is now being done in, in more and more places around the country because it, there is no panacea. There is no silver bullet for a lot of the things that you guys want to solve. It is a very complex community interaction type of approach that you want to use, but underpin it with data. Underpin it with, don't talk about whether you think there's a parking problem or not. Count the cars and know. Don't talk about whether you think it's a little dangerous crossing a street on foot like I just did. Actually count the cars and the speeds and how long it takes to cross and who yields. And that's something that anybody can do with a little bit of advice. And then you can use people with experience who work all around the country to help pull it together. So I would not look at this as a single issue. I see a hand. I'm coming up. Yes. I'm just wondering, I don't know the name of one of the streets, but the Jefferson extension that comes down into the center, and then there's another street that comes down by citizens, wouldn't the, the little street by the parking lot that comes from... The one that's blocked off? Yeah. the Bagman little, Road. That's what? Okay. Um, wouldn't it make more sense to block those two areas and have like a sitting area? That way you still have the, a nice flow going down that Hagman Road to, for large trucks to get around or just, and then you don't take up as many parking spaces away because those two little streets never had parking on them to begin with. I, well, I think the bank one did. I think it had two spots right there, but There's if no you have- There's no final design. Oh, this, this is isn't a, a final? This is a pilot, and I have to okay. report back to the council. So right. there's no well, final I'm just design saying. that's been accepted by the council. The council only has approved a pilot study on traffic flow and road blockages. Okay. And All then right. the report back to them, the finding and comments, and I do get emails, we do save them. Okay. Be considered. No, I, I was just saying, you could process. still get the same, you know, having seating areas that are nice for people to sit around, but it doesn't take away from the parking spaces that businesses are looking to keep near their stores, and it seems to give a better flow. I, I'm just, nope, I didn't know I, if this was permanent or not. Nope, this is a okay. pilot. Yep. Uh, this uh, fellow down here, and I'll be right back to you. Um, I just throw in that you're doing it right. You do a pilot. You do the worst case kind of scenario, close the whole thing down and see what works. And you're getting the data. Thank you. Uh, Jack Dowd. I live in uh, Winthrop for 60 years. And uh, at a point in my life, I could run across half this town in two minutes. Uh, a lot of people are talking about walking to uh, businesses or walking from their residence to business. But um, things change. Uh, a lot of people have to uh, drive uh, and, and get out of their car. Uh, I noticed in the last week with this pilot program that it's a little bit of an inconvenience uh, to some people to get to a business that they regularly, regularly be, been doing business with uh, for, for 30 years at Withup Center. And I, and I realize that things do change. One of the changes that um, I'm concerned with in the center business district is um, the new um, ordinances for building at the Winthrop Center. Uh, I know there's a lot of developers uh, that are interested in uh, putting residences in Winthrop Center. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is that in the new ordinances, you can purchase a parking space on the streets in Winthrop Center for $2,000. Um, I, 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 I read it a couple of years ago and I, and I refreshed uh, uh, my thoughts uh, just yesterday uh, about that fact. The new ordinances 
allow you to purchase a parking space. That means if uh, you know, uh, th there was a, a, a developer last month that wanted to purchase or build a development that had no parking space. So he's allowed to, with a $2,000 one-time fee, to purchase a parking space. So they just, uh, just want to correct you, Jack. You don't purchase a parking spot. Um, what happens is you pay the 2000 to utilize potential spots. You don't get a spot. You can park on the street. You can park on the street, or you so can park long-term. You're not required to have parking long -term, for long -term, let me finish. your residence. It's a, it's, this is a building zoning question, which is better referred to the building department. But all that $2,000 does have to go into a parking fund. So, I understand that. So, I read so it. I just want to make sure you understand that completely. I understand it completely. Uh, so you don't have to have parking if you build a, a um, development. You can just purchase a one-time fee for $2,000 to park on town property. Is that correct? No. You can park. There's no guarantee you're going to park on town property. It's snow emergencies. We don't guarantee you a spot whether you paid that 2000 or not. So that 2000 gets you through the zoning question if you don't have enough parking so on that, your that property. So that issue is going to be taking up with planning board meetings. Is that correct? That's correct. That's a proper uh, form for, the, bring, for that discussion. I, I just wanted to reference that one fact uh, that, that concerns me. And so I hope there's a lot of discussion about uh, that new, new ordinance. Thank you very much. And I just want to be clear for everyone at home, uh, Jack, that um, you know my mother's lived here 80, 84 years. I've lived here 70, 47 years. Um, I have family in between that. There's no intent on uh, the town manager's belief or the council's belief that we want a big, overgrown downtown. We want to keep it quaint. We want to keep it beautiful. We don't want overshadowing. Those are the issues we are aware of, that we don't want to destroy the downtown. But we, we might want to add capacity down there. Thank you for your comments. At the very end of our time, I want to make sure we have time for our last question. Yes, I have one more thing to say. Uh, it's my understanding that there's, and I mentioned at the last meeting, that th there is a possibility between 100 and 300 new residences in the center, uh, center uh, district uh, is that correct? 100 to 300 units proposed. Uh, there's no developer that has proposed 100 or 300 or a combination of developers that have proposed the combination of 100 or 300. Thank you uh, for letting me talk. You're welcome. All right. So this is probably going to be our last question. It's, we're at the top of the hour. Here. Uh, thank Jim Murray. Uh, thank you for coming, sir. Um, in your experience traveling the country, in New England especially, you said right at the very beginning, everyone uh, struggles with the parking. They don't want to give it up. Do you find it works best when the committees that are working on that reach out to the businesses and actually have business engagement of the people it may or may not affect, but perceptively they feel it will affect them? Is it enough? to just do minimal? Or do you find the best outcomes happen when the businesses are actually engaged? Thank you. So I'd say in, in any place I worked, and this is a good um, last question, um, the key to success to making anything we've talked about here tonight is indeed a level of community involvement and partnership. Without doubt, merchants, nearby residents, government officials, um, a variety of the key stakeholders. We are always afraid, and, and most people in my business are afraid of the squeaky wheel. We're afraid of having rotten tomatoes thrown at us. The easiest path is always the one with the least resistance. If you're ever going to make parking work in your downtown, you cannot approach it that way. You have to take it head on. And if you take it head on, as I said at the end, treating it just like you would 
You all have your little place to park. You all know where you park in Winthrop Center that works for you. And a few of us has been jostled lately and that's got to change. But you do it because you skirt the regulations or you know just how it's gonna work and that's your little golden egg. And those exist in each and every one of us and everybody has their own way of skirting things. When we start to become open about this, when we start to discuss this, you realize commonalities. You realize everybody looks at the same problem in a different way. They look at that parking space as hair salon access, as senior parking, as loading, as bar patron. And when you start to all talk amongst a broader group, you start to realize that the problems you face are much bigger, broader, and yet still all around the same basic thing. Getting in and out, finding availability, having access into your downtown and making it work. So yes, get your merchants involved. Yes, get your Julia's involved. Yes, have your town involved. And really try to treat this not as a difficult problem to solve, because it isn't. There's lots of great best practice out there that shows that you can work really, really well and make this sing for you. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Jason Triver. Thank you so much, Jason. This was amazing. I'm so glad uh, so many of you were here. Um, really glad that we had this opportunity. I want to just publicly thank some of the town councilors who are here in the room. Um, Heather Engman, Russ Sanford, um, Jim Letary was here. Who am I missing? Rich Boyajian, of course. Um, and of course, the, the town council, uh, town manager. manager. Um, and thanks to the town manager's office for working with me and making this happen. This was kind of a pipe dream of mine when I moved to Winthrop a year ago. I said, someday I'm going to bring my old boss here. <laughs> uh, Jason and my time in Nelson Nagar was actually what inspired me to um, continue as an urban planner as to specialize in transportation. So um, you can all thank him for having to deal with me. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, did you want to say anything? I else? just wanted to say thank you to you and to Jason for coming on. I don't want to forget Joe Domalov, who works hard with, with this group. The pilot program has you know, brought a lot of people's attention to what's going on in the center, and that's a good thing. It's still a pilot program. We know we need to make some adjustments, potentially. We love what we heard from Jason. We wanted to make it work for each and one of the businesses in town, as well as the residents, as best we can. We are working hard. This is something that's been happening for the last two or three years, but now the rubber hit the road, and that's why all the attention is being drawn uh, to tonight's particular uh, information as well as the last couple of weeks. We'll work hard to make it work for you. We want it to work for all of us. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.